Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Helping you wake up, remembering this is our Father's world. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles, arms out wide. If we're gonna fear, we fear no evil. We will rise by your power. We will go by your spirit. We are bold. If we're gonna stand, we stand as giants. If we're gonna walk, we walk as lions. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Carmen LaBerge. This is Mornings with Carmen. You're listening to the Faith Radio Network, and maybe that's a surprise to you this morning because you thought, hey, normally when I tune in, this is not what I'm hearing. So it's possible you're listening in Billings, Montana, and um, your radio station is now a part of the Faith Radio family, and we are so thrilled that you're here. So I'm Carmen LaBerge. I have the privilege of hanging out with you for a couple of hours Every weekday morning, we call it Mornings with Carmen, Uh, and here's what we're doing. We are seeking to encourage one another in the name of Jesus. We get into the Word of God so that the Word of God can get into us before we get out there into the world that God so loves. We address some of the headlines of the day. We do that in conversation with, you know, folks who've given some thought to some things from a Christian perspective, and uh, my goal is that you and I would be more fully equipped for the challenges that we're going to face in the conversations that lie ahead of us on this day, in this day. So there you go. That's what we're doing here. I hope you find it encouraging. We have a text line. It's always open. We'd love to hear from you. So let me know that you're out there this morning, 877-933-2484 is the number for the text line, 877-933-2484. You could go ahead and put that in your phone. Um, You could call it Faith Radio because it's available um, all hours of the day and night. And even if there's not somebody on the text line right at the moment, trust me when I tell you, as soon as um, as soon as we see it, like right now, somebody in the 770 area code just texted in. My guess is they are listening to a podcast by my friend and colleague Susie Larson because their text is actually to Susie. (laughs) So there you go. They're not listening live right now to the broadcast. They're listening on the Faith Radio app or they're listening um, to to something that they have uh, connected with at MyFaithRadio.com. So we want to be available to you. That's who we are. Um, And we love doing what we we do, which is to glorify God in, in the person and in the name of Jesus Christ, always and always. So here we go. We start off each day with something called the Growing Your Faith verse of the day because we want you to be in the Word of God, um, again, so that the Word of God can get into us um, as people who want to be filled with grace and truth. So um, you can sign up for the Growing Your Faith verse of the day at MyFaithRadio.com. Um, today's Growing Your Faith verse of the day comes from John chapter 15, verses 16 and 17. This is Jesus speaking. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for in my name. This is my command. Love each other. So there's a lot in here, and we're going to um, unpack what is here in just a moment. Let me um, remind you that the context uh, is Jesus on the night in which he is going to be betrayed. This is the night of the Last Supper. This is the night of the foot washing. This is the night of the walk through um, through the valley and his teaching about the vine and the branches, which is the 15th chapter of the gospel according to John. So that's the context. Where, um, where Jesus lands this particular teaching is with this command. This is my command, love each other. It's a little bit weird, don't you think, to command love? It's always, it's always struck me as a little bit strange to be commanded to love. Love isn't something that we think about needing to be commanded to do, right? Here are some things I needed to be commanded to do as a child. Clean your room, brush your teeth, share your toys. Increasingly, um, I hear myself saying, turn off those electronics, (laughs) do your homework. These are some of the things that we need to be commanded to do. Um, 
But if, in fact, loving God and loving neighbor in the same way that I love myself are a summary of God's entire command structure, I mean, when Jesus is asked, what is the first and greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your uh, heart, soul, and strength. And, and ho, hey, the second command is, is like that, love your neighbor as yourself. He says everything else hangs on those two commands. So when Jesus commands us to love each other, he's just amplifying what he's already said are the first and second of the commandments, to love God and to love neighbor as we love self. So if everything else somehow falls into the command structure of love, then somehow all of those things, cleaning your room, brushing your teeth, sharing your toys, turning off your electronics and doing your homework, blah, 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 I mean, on and on, each and every one of those is somehow an act of love. Stick with me here. Jesus is speaking um, here in the final hours that he's going to spend with his disciples in this life. They've just celebrated the final Passover meal during which Jesus got up from the table, he picked up a towel, he bent down, and he washed their feet in an act of love. He also transformed a meal that memorialized the event of God's grace when the spirit of death passed over the homes of the Hebrew slaves. Remember that back in the days just before the Exodus? They put their trust in God. They were slaves in Egypt. There was no more sacred meal than the Passover meal that Jesus was celebrating with his disciples on this night. But during the meal, he, he, he changes the script. And he breaks the bread and he hands it to them and he says, this is my body broken for you. He invites them to eat of it as a representation of him and his sacrifice. And then he says, you know, this cup is representative of my blood. Pour it out for the forgiveness of your sins. It's a new covenant. God was instituting a new covenant of forgiveness of sins. Jesus was in the process of walking with them through the vineyards in the valley um, that grow between where they celebrated this meal in the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane, where we know that you know he, he bowed down to pray in ultimate submission um, to God's will in view of the cross. This is just a couple of hours before his betrayal and arrest. The context here is the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John. I commend it to you in its entirety. Jesus is talking about being the vine and his father, the vine dresser. He's talking about um, you and I, every disciple, as a branch. Um, it's It's the conversation about abiding in him, abiding in him and producing fruit that's worthy of being called his disciple. Verse 10 in John 15 says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father command, Father's commandments and abide in his love. This is my command, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that you would lay down your life for your friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. That's the context. That's the context in which Jesus says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And I have appointed you to go and to bear fruit as branches of a vine. That your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he's going to give it to you. Because you're with me, my Father is going to do for you what you ask in my name. These things I command. Love one another. Jesus then goes on um, to talk about how much the world is going to hate his followers in the same way that it hates him. So the transition from love to hate in John chapter 15 is pretty swift. I think we ought not forget that as we are commanded to love by Jesus and in the name of Jesus in the world today. We shouldn't expect the world to respond to us in the kind of love uh, that we want. We should expect the world to respond to us the way it responded to Jesus. No greater love has anyone ever shown than he showed. And people didn't respond to him with appreciation. That's probably worthy of keeping in mind today as we seek to love the world in the name and in the spirit of Jesus. Our friend Daryl Crouch is going to join us next. Um, Have you ever wondered, like, what, what was Jesus doing between Easter and his ascension into heaven? 
We're going to talk about that next because that's the that's the period of time we're in right now. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. I'm Carmen LaBerge. This is Faith Radio. What was Jesus doing after he rose from the dead, but before he ascended into heaven? This is the period of Easter. We find ourselves in it right now. Our friend Daryl Crouch is joining us from Everyone's Wilson, where they bring people from every sphere of influence together to create initiatives for spiritual and social transformation in their particular community. Um, And I'm encouraging everybody to, you know, like, go and be like Daryl. So, Daryl, good morning. Welcome back. You're so kind. It's good to be with you, Carmen. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so um, as of yesterday, we have brand new friends listening in Billings, Montana, where um, a station has just become a part of the Faith Radio um, network. And so how about this, Daryl? Um, why do you join us on Mornings with Carmen every couple of weeks? Like, why, why do you get up early in the morning to do this? Well, that's a great question. My wife asked me that, so that's good. I appreciate that. (laughs) No, we love Carmen, and we love... um, (laughs) Oh, wow. There's some unsolicited... That's that's nice, man. Thanks. I I mean, at 6.08 in the morning, what else would we do? I mean, really. Um, This is just such an incredible space that you're in, and the encouragement that you give to everyone who listens in to uh, walk with Jesus by walking in his word. We really don't know um, who God is and what he's doing in the world and and certainly who Christ in us, the hope of glory, is outside of his word and learning how to to read the Bible, uh, talk about the Bible. I think sometimes, and one of the, uh, and and this is not pre, you know, we we didn't uh, scheme um, uh, on this at all, but I just think sometimes, we need words. We need language uh, to give to our faith. And certainly the Bible gives us words and language. But I think in a modern context, sometimes we're not exactly sure how to talk about wow. these things um, that are so intimate and so important to us. And so I think to hear uh, capable, energetic, uh, encouraging voices uh, give us give us language Give us some hooks to hang on to day to day is just such an invaluable thing. So thank you for doing that. Welcome, Billings, Montana. We're so excited to have you in the family. Right. It's so much fun. And if you are just listening for the very first time in Billings or anywhere, and you're like, who are these people and what are they talking about? We will actually want to send you a digital welcome packet. Just text the word welcome to 877-933-2484. We want to get to know you. We want you to get to know us. So text the word welcome to 877-933-2484. Okay, Daryl, we have all um, celebrated Easter. We, we mm-hmm. you know, just in awe of the empty tomb. Um, and then what? What is Jesus doing between Easter and his ascension into heaven? Well, that's a great question, and the Bible does tell us uh, we we have a good bit of information. We don't have you know day to day play by play, but we have at least eight uh, appearances of Jesus that are documented in the in the Scripture, and uh, we won't go through all those one by one necessarily. But um, there were a number of things that Jesus was doing. He was announcing his victory, uh, meeting with his disciples, those that were closest to him. Uh, the the including the men and the women who were close by, he appeared to them certainly in the in the garden uh, after the resurrection. You know, immediately on Sunday morning, we would uh, we would talk about and but beyond that, he began to appear to several people uh, that were important to him, and and I think there's a few things that happened as far as I, as I can read the scripture. There's a few things that happened that are really important to us for today. One, he announced victory, that that he did display his um, victorious victory or victory over sin, death, and the grave. He uh, validated, that's the word I was looking for, he validated uh, who he said he was and what he had come to do for the disciples and other followers that were really confused on, on Saturday. 
uh, Friday and Saturday were very difficult. To, to think that we had placed all of our hope and expectation, our reputations, we had given up family relationships, we had put ourselves in a vulnerable place with the Roman authorities, and so on and so on. And um, what a devastating, and we talk about doubting Thomas, but all the disciples, everybody was struggling with, with what this would mean. And so Jesus was gracious to reveal himself to these uh, these dear friends, um, and let let them know that he has done what he promised he would do, and that some so much of the teachings that they did not understand, uh, now he is able to um, to bring greater light and give them understanding. I think about the men on the road to, to Emmaus that he appeared to; they just had their minds were so clouded and their hearts were so distant from the mission of God in that moment. They didn't even recognize Jesus. But as he began to speak, he revealed himself. He was so gracious to them. I think that's an important, to me, that's an important piece of all of this, that uh, all of these followers who really failed, uh, at least their faith failed in those moments, he did not wag his finger at them, but he um, he received them. He was gracious to them. So um, he announced victory. I think secondly, he he gave clarity. Um, clarity is um, so important. We walk by faith, not by sight. But in these again, in these moments after the resurrection, these days after the resurrection, the disciples needed to say, "Well, well okay, now what? What what does all of this mean?" And Jesus provided clarity for that. He built confidence. They were emboldened. Um, Peter is a great, I think, a great example of all of this. But he, um, you know, certainly we know his story of denying Christ uh, three times. Uh, looking across the courtyard, Jesus and Peter made eye contact as as Jesus was on trial. Um, it, it was a devastating moment for Peter. Um I think um, what he what he experienced and how he struggled with the with the Lord during those you know hours of the crucifixion and so on. We I just don't think any of us can imagine. But um, on the on the shores, uh, Jesus met with with Peter and the others, and they cooked fish together and uh, broke bread together. Um, I, I think you know he restored Peter. But I think he restored the others as well. I, I think uh, everybody was there to watch what was happening, and they all knew. And um, so I think there was a restoration process there. And then finally, he instilled the mission, Carmen. He said, this is this is why you're here. This is what's happening. I want you to go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he said, I'm going to be with you. I'm not abandoning you. I'm giving you, but you you need to wait on the coming of the Holy Spirit. So I think he he spent a lot of time with the people that he loved and uh, reminded them of who who he was and what he had come to do and that um, that the future was um, secure and uh, and that their mission was clear. So anyway, those are a few summary so things, but really important. No, that's so good. Let's take a very brief break. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Daryl Crouch. Have you ever thought much about what Jesus was doing between Easter and um, 40 days later when he issues um, what we know of or what we uh, what we rehearse as the Great Commission uh, in the final chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, but also articulated um, by Luke in Acts chapter 1? Have you ever thought about like what, what is happening during those 40 days. 40 days is a lot of time for the risen Savior to be operating in the world. Um, what was he doing? Um, when you use your holy imagination um, and think about what Jesus might have done and accomplished and who he might have seen and visited and what counsel and consolation he might have offered and what celebrations might have taken place, like just revel, um, just revel for a moment in the joy of the disciples of Jesus following his resurrection and how empowering that would have been in terms of their equipping for the mission upon which he was sending them. Because the same holds true for you and me. 
We'll continue our conversation in just a moment. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Back when I was in college, I invited a friend to church. Now, she had literally never been in a church before. So I tried to think of all the things that it would help to explain. We got there early and I showed her around. We got a bulletin. I told her what to expect. But when the offering basket actually came by, she held on to it, looked down and asked out loud, what is this? Now, I want you to imagine trying to explain that during worship while the soloist is singing. Now, what makes this story really funny is that she held the basket. I mean, she was asking an honest question and I was honestly trying to answer, but she's holding the basket and the ushers are getting antsy. And because I had passed the basket to her, I couldn't easily like take it back. So there we sat. I'm attempting to explain the collection of tithes and offerings. My friend is holding the basket. The person on the other side of her is like wide-eyed, boring a hole into me. It's funny now, but I literally like feel the sweat that was rolling down my back in that moment. Explaining why we support a ministry can be challenging. This is listener-supported radio and listener-supported digital media. You're listening to it via podcast, so that's made possible by the financial support of listeners just like you. During our spring fundraiser, we passed the plate. In short, we need your help. If you've never given before, maybe you could consider a dollar a day. It's not actually about the size of the gift. It's about everyone doing their part to make the whole thing possible. So help us continue to share the faith by sharing in faith now. You can give right now by clicking the link in the show notes, by going to MyFaithRadio.com, or texting the word GIVE to 877-933-2484. And thanks in advance. All right. Why 40 days? Good question, Andrew, on the text line. If you've got a question, um, a a prayer concern, a comment, you want to introduce yourself, the text line is open 877-933-2484. Daryl, Andrew is on the text line, and Andrew wants to know, why 40 days? Why did Jesus appear for 40 days and then ascend into heaven? You and I would also know that 10 days after that, um, we we have Pentecost, um, mm-hmm. the 50th day. Can you just talk a little bit about the 40-day rhythm? Um, what's going on there? 40 days comes up a lot. The, the number 40 comes up a lot in the Bible. It really does. And I, I, I think... Um... It does come up a lot, and there there's debate about whether that's a, a you know a generic kind of general term, you know, a general fr- time frame, or whether it's specific. I choose to believe it's specific. I believe the Bible's clear about a lot of things, and where it's clear, we can be clear. And so the forty days does come up a lot. Uh, I think uh, there's conjecture that we could we we could make about why forty days. Um, At the end of the day, and I don't know if this is a great answer, I don't think we know. I think we know that this is what Jesus wanted to do and that God is provident. Uh, He's um, such a good answer because it's a a humble and honest answer. So, yes, it's a really good answer. Yeah, we don't. don't, Thank you. But, you know, I've I've read all the, you know, all the the right, you know, the things that people would say. But uh, the final paragraph on those chapters is we really don't know. And we know that he wanted to spend time with these friends and disciples. Uh, we know that um, he had some things he wanted to complete before he ascended to the Father. And um, we believe he completed everything that he was called to do in the time that and and marked the time needed to do those things. And so I think we we can um, again conjecture about those. And it's interesting because we. It does lead us to a study of the scripture where uh, 40 days does come up uh, a number of times from the Old Testament uh, all the way through, and and that's an interesting kind of study. But uh, for me, Carmen, and for the listeners, I, I just say, you know, the Bible says he was here for 40 days. He met with these people, and I trust that he accomplished it was the time that he needed to accomplish everything that he was sent to do. Yeah, and I think I'm, I'm always reminded that, uh, I mean, as Peter tells us, you know, one day is a thousand years with the Lord and a thousand years is a day. So um, I'm, I don't, I don't want to get caught up in the, 
uh, in, in maybe the numerology conversations about mm-hmm. the Bible and specific um, specifics like that, because I do think we can get lost. Um, we can get lost in those things. the The big important thing is He is risen. He is risen indeed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the so what for each of us in terms of what was Jesus doing in the days after His resurrection? Um, he was uh, as as Daryl has so beautifully articulated. Like right, He was. He was providing evidence um, that produced confidence. And the building of the confidence and the emboldening of the first disciples is one of the things that you and I have the opportunity as disciples today um, to reflect on and respond to. You know, have you had that kind of life-changing experience that Peter um, that Peter experienced on the beach with Jesus? Have you had the kind of aha Jesus made known to you in the breaking of the bread and feeling that heartburn within you as he's been walking around with you. Have you, that's the walk to Emmaus story. Have you acknowledged the demonstration of God's power over sin and, and death and the grave? Do you have clarity for the now what? Um, we live not only on this side of Easter in view of the resurrection, but we also have the privilege of living um, beyond those 40 days and and actually beyond the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And so um, maybe we'll talk about Pentecost the next time we're together, Daryl, But because the giving mm. of the Holy Spirit is sort of the next big, big thing um, that happens after the resurrection of Jesus. So thank you for walking with us as we walk by faith in these days and helping us to see how the Word of God as the living Word is actually the Word we're called to live today. Well, it's a it's a joy and it's a privilege, and I think what you've said here in this this segment is so important that the the question is: Have we had a personal experience with Jesus that has transformed our lives? Jesus met with these friends and disciples, and um, the work that he did in their lives um, has produced us sitting here two th- over two thousand years later still worshiping the risen Savior and talking about him this morning. And so um, the work that Jesus did in the lives of those disciples was literally uh, life-changing for millions and millions and millions of people. And so um, uh, it's an invitation for us to know him and make him known. So good. Love you, brother. Blessings. Hey, love you. Hey, thanks so much. Y'all have a great day. Yeah, likewise. That's that's Daryl Crouch. He's a he's a good friend. You're going to hear him every couple of weeks. If you're just now tuning in for the very first time, I'm Carmen LeBurge. This is Mornings with Carmen. This is the Faith Radio Network, and we have conversations that we hope glorify God and, and edify you as you prepare to walk your faith out there into the world that God so loves and to do so in ways that honor Jesus. Um, the Arizona Supreme Court ruled yesterday— upholding a 160-year-old law. And that 160-year-old law actually predates Arizona becoming a state. Like, that's a little bit crazy, right? So Arizona became a state in 1912. The law that their state Supreme Court um, upheld yesterday is from around 1864. And technically, it's still the law in the books. And so um, in, in that law, it is illegal in nearly all cases for a person to take the life of an unborn human being. And the only exception for, you know, abortion under this 1864 law um, is for the preservation of the life of the mother. And so, as you can imagine, um, there are already abortion advocates um, collecting signatures to get an abortion rights measure on the November ballot in um, in Arizona. Um, abortion is is a big issue. Um, it's a it's a primary driver in the uh, election conversation here in the United States of America. But let me just say this, like abortion is the intentional taking of a human life. And so from a Christian worldview, from a biblical worldview, there's there's really not an abortion debate. There's just not. Um, if abortion is the intentionally killing of, a, of an unborn human being, the taking of an innocent life, then it is contrary to the will of God. And so um, 
we have to call it what it is, and then we have to figure out how we're going to be pro-life in in every stage of life, for every life, for with the goal of human flourishing. So um, if you need help finding your voice in the abortion debate, stick around because that's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. All right, who is out there helping you make sense of what's going on in the world and helping you walk by faith um, in the midst of the challenges that we face in the culture today? I am walking alongside and with my friends at the Denison Forum. If you're just tuning in and just joining us, denisonforum.org. O-R-G, um, exists to thoughtfully engage the issues of the day from a biblical perspective. And our friend from the Denison Forum, Mark Terman, joins us um, from time to time to, to bring all of God's Word to bear on what's happening in the headline news. So, Mark, welcome. And maybe you want to say a word of welcome to our new friends in Billings, Montana. We just added a new station to the Faith Radio Network, and so they're tuning in for the first time and thought you might want to say hi. And good morning yeah. to Billings. I uh, uh, I have a friend that uh, I uh, got to hire to work at my church a couple of years ago who's from Billings, and uh, so I learned a lot more about that part of the country, and so we're, we are grateful to have you along with us and hope that we can be helpful to you. All right. What is that person's last name? His last name is Franks. All right. So the Franks family listening in Billings, Montana, a little shout out to the Franks family. You did a good job. Um, yes. Obviously, if I mean, you know, if you hired him, then right, they did a good job raising him. That's right. He came down here yeah. to came down here to prepare for ministry and found a Texas girl, and they've stayed right here ever since. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, okay, so I would like to talk with you about a number of developments on you know on the abortion front. So the former president Donald Trump made a statement um, on the topic of abortion. Lots of folks talking about that. The Vatican has issued um, a, a very sweeping document that is affirming of life. Um, the Arizona Supreme Court has banned most abortions in that state, upholding a law that um, is actually from the 1800s. There's a new ad for President Biden's reelection campaign that features a woman in Texas. Um, and it's it's a Trump did this is the tagline and it's abortion related. Um, abortion access in America and the rise of abortion after the overturning of Roe v. Wade is a topic of conversation as well. So is there is there a thread you want to pull or would you like to weave some of these together? Well, let's see if we can do a little bit of both. But uh, yeah, there's a lot going on here. And uh, in some ways, I think we should be um, uh, we should be glad that we're having a conversation about the sanctity of life. Just this most fundamental and uh, initial gift of God, that we didn't create ourselves, we can't create ourselves, and that life itself is the gift that God has given us, that we might know him and know each other. Uh, I just continue to be astounded at Genesis 2-7, that God breathed into man the breath of life. God shared his life, his breath, with the first man, and that we have the very breath of God that has caused us to come alive. And uh, if we can somehow communicate the beauty and wonder and majesty of that truth coming out of the very first pages of the Bible, uh, we could we possibly move? Could we dream of a day when not only our churches but our country and even our our world would see that as the most fundamental gift and first gift that God ever gave us. Uh, he gave us himself in that way, and he's, and he's continued to do so. And so it's tragic that uh, so many people don't understand that, and so many people uh, look upon an unplanned pregnancy or an unwanted pregnancy as an invasion and an inconvenience. But how can we get them to the place where they understand that, that enormous gift? I think that, first of all, thank you for framing it that way, because it if I can get back to the place in the conversation where I'm talking about God, and I'm talking about creation, and I'm talking about life, and I'm talking about the gift of life, and I'm talking about the reality of 
life lived as a gift, um, then I'm then I'm sort of standing up in you know out of the waters of culture that tell me that my life is my own, my body is my own, my future is my own, you know, the world is my oyster, you know, like whatever, like right. So I think that part of this is reminding one another of the truth in the midst of a culture that is telling us a lot of stories that are not true truth. Yeah, I would totally agree. And that, uh, you know, we are living in a world where the word identity uh, has been uh, just raised up as something that you and I and other people can manufacture for themselves. Well, just think about the enormity of that weight that we're going to uh, we are going to self-determine our identity. Well, you start thinking about that in the longer and deeper sense. To me, that means that we have an enormous amount of pressure and we find ourselves caught in between of our our sinfulness, our depravity, in which we want to try to be God on our own, but then we find ourselves totally inadequate to even define our own lives. Uh, we're very... Uh, poor at doing it, and the weight and the responsibility of that just is, in many ways, crushing. Now, I'm not saying that there's not some responsibility that we carry in that, but to start from the place that my identity is given to me by God, is received by me when God gives me life through my parents, that takes an enormous burden off of me and allows God to be God, and uh, and, and we struggle with that, but if we can start to get our heart and mind around that with the Holy Spirit's help, it, 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 it relieves so much pressure on us that I, I can let God explain and define who I am rather than trying to invent that on my own, which I have no capacity for. And that's a, a place that really becomes a place of freedom to me and that I can go to the perfect almighty creator who loves me and let him help me understand what it means to be a human being and what it means to be a human being well. And then we start moving out from that foundation to a place where, uh, you know, Carmen, I think we're really at a place where it's just, it, it just defies all logic for someone to say that that child in the womb is not a human being. Uh, mm -hmm. Medical science is so clear on this. God has given us uh, technology that just makes it so clear that that child in the womb is uh, a human being in every respect. And to deny that is just to deny plain reality. Uh, and so how can we now move people to the place of, of seeing that is sacred, seeing all life is sacred, and then starting from that foundation, foundation saying, okay, what is the right, best, most holy thing I can do in relationship to this person that is yet to be born, but soon to be born, and every other human being that I see. That, that's where we have to try to move the culture. So, uh, first of all, thank you for sort of weaving all of that together, because I do think that connecting the life conversation to the identity conversation to the sexuality conversation or the marriage conversation, uh, even to conversations um, that you and I would consider you know, in the scope of of life conversations and life affirming conversations, so uh, conversations about immigrants or people with disabilities or the end of life conversations that are taking place as well, all of that is a part of this very large conversation about God as the giver of life and God as the author of life and therefore the one who has authority and sovereignty over every component part of life and living life um, in communion with God um, and responsive to him in the midst of this incredibly beautiful world that he has given us to not only inhabit, but steward um, as his managers and on his behalf. So we're going to continue our conversation with Mark Terman here in just a moment. Um, the, the Vatican actually issued a sweeping um, declaration, um, and it, it is this statement in support of human identity. And it does cover many of the topics um, that we have just touched on. And so, you know, how how is it that you, as a believer in Jesus, walk by faith in the midst of uh, of all of the issues of the day? And how do you apply the mind of Christ 
um, to the conversations that are happening and how do you walk with confident hope in the power of Christ, um, even when the world and the people of the world disagree with you um, on on all kinds of, of issues. Um, so we're going to talk about that next here on Mornings with Carmen, give some thought to um, how much God loves each and every human being, regardless of their age or stage or vulnerability or um, or how much power and influence they have in the world. Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. How do we apply that truth to every person at every age and stage? That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Anne texted me, and then we had a conversation on the phone. She's 86 years old, and her husband, Bob, is 96. She listens to the podcast every single day, and she gets a lot of encouragement for her walk of faith in the midst of a life that has grown difficult and weary in many ways. Anne has a faith radio story, and so do you. If faith radio is a part of your daily journey with God, we'd love to hear your story. Share how God is using Faith Radio to encourage you and help you grow at MyFaithRadio.com. And who knows, maybe Anne will hear your story and be encouraged as well. All right, when's the last time you were slapped in the face? Um, Some people regard it as a slap in the face that a politician would, uh, would say something contrary to their biblically informed worldview. Um... I think we respond to a slap in the face uh, with a turn of the cheek and we respond to the ways of the world with um, calm, confident clarity and a rearticulation of um, of who God is and what God has to say about such things. And therefore, I did appreciate very much the declaration from the Vatican issued uh, on the theme of human dignity, addressing a range of concerns, including gender theory and surrogacy and euthanasia, in addition to abortion and poverty and human trafficking and war. If you want to read the whole thing, I'm happy to send you the direct link. Just let me know. Text me at 877-933-2484. Mark Terman is here from the Denison Forum. Um, Mark, um, I don't know, your reaction, your response to um, the Vatican statement on the dignity of human beings. Yeah, I haven't read the statement, but I've read a couple of reports about it, and I was really pleased to see this come out, uh, and interesting, uh, if not providential, I don't know, that uh, it would come out at this moment. Uh, But so many uh, positive statements, biblical statements, uh, in a strong way, uh, and comes out at a particularly important and useful time. Um, but I just love how uh, this emphasizes from a from a biblical perspective uh, just how sacred all human life is and all human beings are, and uh, the dig- the word dignity uh, follows lot right along with that. Uh, I think in some ways uh, there's a tension here that we've seen over the last few years that Pope Francis uh, may not have. Uh, said things exactly the way this document does. So there, there seems to be some tension uh, within Catholic uh, authorities and within their thinking, which uh, I, I guess that's fine, you know, but I'm glad that they came out with this statement that they've apparently been working on it for the better part of five years and been pretty quiet about working on it. But uh, I love the way it comes out and affirms so many biblical truths. Uh, I, um, I like the scope of it, and I like the clarity. Um, I do think it's going to provide really good um, conversational opportunity, particularly when we get you know down into the weeds of it. Um, I think there are a lot of people, Mark, who they believe what um, sort of what the pattern of the world has been in terms of, hey, you know, I can. I can wait and choose to get married if and when I choose that in my life path. And and then if and when um, I decide that the time is right for me to have the child of my choosing, you know, that should happen for me. And if that's inconvenient or, you know, past the point where my body can do it for whatever reason, you know, I could just hire a womb. I could just go get somebody else um, to do that for me. Um, 
And the issue of surrogacy is directly addressed in um, in this piece from the Vatican, and it it recognizes um, the right of a child to um, be raised in a family in the context of their own mother and their own father. Um, it it acknowledges um, the the respect and the dignity of of the child, and that that nobody has a right to a child. Nobody. Nobody has a right to a child. A child has all kinds of rights, but you and I, neither one of us, nor does anybody else, have a quote-unquote right to a child. Um, the objectification you know, of children or the commodification of children is at issue here, and they connect it, they, they connect it right into um, issues related to human trafficking and poverty and, um, you know, and the way people of means use people of lesser means for their own ends. It is a, it is a profound statement. Yeah, I think so. And, and I, I noticed the statement that called out the, uh, the, the dignity, um, and the sacredness of the surrogate, uh, mother Mm -hmm. uh, and Mm -hmm. just how, uh, surrogacy is, uh, in many ways an attack upon that lots of complex issues. I I can imagine that there are people listening to us who want to be parents yeah. And and have reasons why they can't be, uh, and so we know that we're touching many hearts in a sensitive way, and and yet I do agree with you in principle that having children uh, for our own happiness is not the best way to think about becoming parents or being parents. Uh, that if we are called into parenthood and God. Uh, allows that and and brings that gift into our life, it becomes something that he's calling us to steward for his glory and for the good of those children. Uh, it it cannot be framed as, I, I have a right to be a parent because it will make me happy. It'll be something I enjoy doing. It'll be something that serves my purposes. That becomes enormously selfish and uh, and I think that's something that this document is trying to call out, that we are looking to uh, a divine God to direct our lives in such a way. And if, and if part of his calling is for us to be parents or to not be parents, that we need to trust him in that. And we need to steward all that he puts in our hands uh, as seeing them as gifts that come down from him and that we should honor him in the way that we steward those gifts, and especially true when it comes to the other lives around us, be they uh, children, be they you know, our aging parents, be it the the friends that we have, the neighbors that we have, that it is our opportunity and responsibility to steward those relationships in a way that expresses the love of Christ to every one of them. Yeah, and it's so contrary to um, to what the culture would tell us, or even what you know, quote unquote, medical science would tell us, and on and on and on. So these are the times that we as Christians um, we have to be willing to speak the truth, even though I I know I know I have just hurt I have hurt your feelings in some cases, and I recognize that. So, um, as Christians, we want to we want to speak the truth. We want to do so in in love. And so, um, if I've if I've hurt your feelings this morning, I want you to sit with that for just a moment, and I want you to um, to ask yourself: Did did Carmen say something that was untrue? Um, because I. I would be. I would welcome. Um, I would welcome your. Um, uh, you know, you you saying so, and so you know. Let me know on the text line. It's open eight seven seven nine three three two four eight four. Children are precious. They are a gift of God. No question about it. Um, and and God has a um, has a will when it comes to how they are conceived and come into the world. And from conception to natural death, um, life belongs to God. It's His gift. So let us be gracious with one another um, as we discuss these things, but definitely let's continue the conversation. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. I'm Carmen LeBurge. Our friend Mark Terman from the Denison Forum has been with us. You can um, you can connect with him at denisonforum.org. We have another hour together. Um, you can check out what is happening at myfaithradio.com, and we'll be right back. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LeBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.